It's no secret Australia's relationship with China is as complicated as it is fragile. On the one hand, they're the key to our economic prosperity. So if we want to be rich, war men bi shi jong ko ren. On the other hand, we fear China's expanding tentacles of influence. We don't want them getting too close. Which brings us to the South Pacific. Somewhat arrogantly, Australia has always considered it our patch of paradise to protect and nurture. But now the Chinese are moving in, splashing their cash in places like Fiji and Vanuatu. So what's next? A Chinese military base right on our doorstep? The tropical playground of Fiji. It'd be hard to think of a more idyllic location for two nations to, discreetly at least, butt heads. But that's exactly what was happening in Suva Harbour last week. Flying the flag for Australia were the warships Melbourne and Adelaide, and quietly stalking them, a Chinese spy ship, pretending, not very well, to be a fishing vessel. Now that's a space uh, surveillance ship, it's a scientific ship. The seriousness of this highly planned, coincidental meeting was not lost on anyone. Is China's aim to be the most powerful nation in the world? I think in the very long term, yes. It's got global ambitions and it's challenging the rules-based international order. Should we be worried about China setting itself up in the South Pacific? Absolutely. These days, around the South Pacific, the Chinese seem to be everywhere. And they're hard to miss. You've only got to look at the money they're throwing around on new buildings. But security analyst Dr Malcolm Davis says what seems like much needed economic assistance for these penniless countries comes at a high price. Well, what the Chinese tend to do is that they put heavy investment into countries that simply don't have the means to pay back the debt. So they're getting countries addicted to debt and then when they call in the debt and the countries can't pay, the Chinese will take a port or a territory or take an island. You basically make them sound like political loan sharks. In effect, yes. If China can get a country so deep in debt that it can't pay back uh, that debt, then China will take something else in return. Which brings us to neighbouring Vanuatu, and more specifically, the key strategic outpost of Luganville. During World War II, this was America's second largest base in the Pacific. Now China has built an immense wharf. It claims is to help the Vanuatu government attract cruise ships to the region. But the wharf's builders did such an impressive job, many are questioning their motives. Does the strategic part of you say there's got to be more to it? There's got to be more to it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Chinese wouldn't be building all this just to cash in on a very limited tourist market here. So what do you think in their heart of hearts they're after? They're thinking commercial influence, political influence and ultimately a military presence. At half a kilometre long, Dr Davis reckons this wharf is complete overkill for the local cruise industry. It is, however, the perfect size for a visiting foreign navy. And that means it's large enough to accommodate large Chinese naval service combatants, guided missile destroyers, cruisers. What do we do, even aircraft carriers? We could talk an aircraft carrier in there as well. When you look at this, do alarm bells go off? In my mind, absolutely, because if the Chinese were to bring uh, naval forces into this region, it fundamentally changes our strategic outlook in a way not seen since the 1940s. Of course, wharves this solid don't come cheap. But China has let Vanuatu put the $114 million it cost on their tab, which currently stands at $220 million. Is this a debt trap? Yes. So the Chinese would be hoping Vanuatu couldn't keep up with the debt repayments? Look, I, think, I don't think the Chinese are doing this out of the goodness of their heart. Um, they're not investing in Vanuatu to help the Vanuatu people. They're investing in Vanuatu to help themselves. This doesn't only happen in the South Pacific. China has form when it comes to debt trap diplomacy. The impoverished African nation of Djibouti owes them a staggering $1.2 billion, 
and China has used part of that debt to create a fully-fledged naval base there. And last year, Sri Lanka defaulted on a massive Chinese loan for a port that many believe it didn't need in the first place. China now owns the port on a 99-year lease. What do you think of the type of businesses that the Chinese government is investing in here, or the projects? Oh, the projects. Um, they are too big for our country. Back in Vanuatu's capital, Port Vila, taxi driver William Tabak says he, and everyone he knows, is worried about China's growing dominance. Already, we know that we borrow a lot of money from China. And... Do you think too much? It's too much. It's too much. Everyone, and uh, if you ask anyone on the street, they say we are frightened of China funding too much projects. Port Vila is littered with Chinese-built landmarks that have locals scratching their heads. This huge stadium was built for a regional games in 2017, and by the look of the hoarding, it hasn't been used for much since then. And even more controversially, this gigantic convention centre that the government can't even afford to pay the power and cleaning bills for, let alone stage events at. We went for a drive the other day and we, we had a taxi driver and we drove past the convention centre and he pointed at that and said, what a waste of money. That is not what our country needs. What do you say to that criticism? Yes, I would agree with that. Can't yes. even pay the electricity bills there. Uh, yes, that's true. We're trying to find a solution to make it work for us. Vanuatu's remarkably frank foreign minister is Ralph Renjanvanu. He concedes his country has made errors in its dealings with China, but denies any suggestions that the massive wharf at Luganville is more for China than it is for Vanuatu. What if Vanuatu gets into financial strife and China comes to you and says, all right, look, we'll bail you out, we'll get rid of the debts, just give us the wharf at Luganville and we'll call it even. What do you say to them? We, um, I, I can't imagine that offer, but uh, we have built that wharf for our economic development. We want, we want uh, Luganville to become a major commercial hub, not only for Vanuatu, but for the region. So can you give us a 100% guarantee right now that China will not have a military base ever in Vanuatu? Yes, I can give you that guarantee. We are a non-aligned country. We're a member of the non-aligned movement. Um, so this big power play that's happening, in which China is involved, in which Australia is involved, Vanuatu, Vanuatu wants to be no part of it. But Malcolm Davis is wary of the Vanuatu government's assurances about Chinese intentions and says everyone in Australia should be as well. Vanuatu is only about 1,500 nautical miles from Sydney. And if the Chinese get or establish a military base, say at Vanuatu or indeed any other South Pacific state, then suddenly we have the prospect of Chinese military forces very close to the Australian eastern seaboard. So you're saying this is a military threat? It's not a military threat now, but it could be a military threat into the future. Coming up, what do you think China's master plan is in this region? Domination. China setting its sights on the entire South Pacific. Is that China's goal, to be the top dog? Absolutely. We reveal their sneaky race for power. What, so you think if they can pump money in here, they'll get support at the UN? Yes, because you have to... Oh, I'm sorry, but that's bribery. Uh, that's next on 60 Minutes. What do you think China's master plan is in this region? Domination. Domination of the region. General Sitaveni Rambuka knows a thing or two about domination. It is in the national interest. He led two military coups in Fiji and later served as the country's prime minister for seven years. But now, as opposition leader, the one-time strongman fears how weakened Fiji has become because of the Chinese. Are you comfortable with the level of involvement China has in, in Fiji's affairs? No, I, I am not. If they become so powerful uh, and we become uh, impotent as far as that 
repayment is concerned, there is a fear that they will uh, take over some of the public uh, uh, facilities we have, our ports and airports. It's happening around the world. Is that a deal that in the long term is going to really turn, turn nasty for this country? Not only for this country, but for the region. Because we're going to uh, be selling our souls. We will have to sell our souls for the comforts of today. General Rambuka doesn't have to take me far to show what he means. The skyline of Fiji's capital, Suva, is rapidly changing. And it's all because of one building, this monstrously out of proportion Chinese development. At 28 storeys, it's more than twice the size of the next tallest tower in the South Pacific. So the Chinese pump money into projects like this. Are these the kind of projects that you actually need? No, not at this time. We need projects, but there is no need to go for a, uh, a very high rise, multiple, multiple storey building every time. Critics of China say the real proof they're not here to help the local economy is that they bring in their own construction workers to build these projects and employ very few locals. Hello, I'm Tom from 60 Minutes Australia. On this site in Suva, it's pretty much 100% Chinese labour, despite a crying need for local construction jobs in Fiji. But when the cameras came out, they're gone. I wanted to ask the men here why they didn't employ any Fijians, but no one was allowed to speak. Do you think the Chinese are worried about helping the locals here get jobs? No, uh, they're bringing in their own labourers, their own workforce to work on projects that they directly benefit from, but really gives nothing back to the society or the people. Dr Malcolm Davis from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute believes the Chinification of Fiji could easily have been avoided. Australia moans a, a lot about China's growing influence in the South Pacific and us losing out as a result of it, but how much have we been the masters of our own demise? Look, I do think uh, we have taken them for granted to a degree. Has Australia dropped the ball? I think in terms of uh, aid and investment into the South Pacific, absolutely we have. I think, you know, Australia um, probably needs to really look at the way they look at the Pacific. Fiji's Attorney General, Syed Kayum, agrees with Malcolm Davis he says Australia turned its back on Fiji after its 2006 coup, which was all the invitation China needed to fill the vacuum. So Australia played it wrong. They left an opening for China. They played it wrong. They left an opportunity for anybody to come in. And China did. China did in respect, yes. And then, of course, one cannot complain about that now. Uh, we are a country. We need to develop. We need to continue with uh, living. We need to continue to uh, grow. Over in Vanuatu, Foreign Minister Ralph Renjinvanu says it's been an identical situation. But having been caught out, he says Australia's now trying to play catch up. I mean, it's a great thing for you guys, isn't it? You've got two countries effectively fighting for your love. Yeah, it's almost like uh, two boys fighting for a girl. <laughs> Do you see China growing and think maybe we want to hitch our wagon to them? Well, we are hitching our wagon to China, definitely. We have, we've got our hitches on a number of wagons. And I think for Vanuatu, that's the best approach. We trying to get the most out of our relations with the maximum number of countries. Is that China's goal, to be the top dog? Absolutely, yeah. There's no doubt that China is going to become the most powerful country in the world. Chinese-born, Canberra-based security expert Adam Nee is another who warns that China's money comes with onerous conditions. Money's pouring into the Pacific from China. Are there strings attached? Absolutely, yeah. The way that China delivers aid and does business is different from the way that we're used to. What we will see to be bribery in the Chinese case seems to be okay, and so that creates uh, a number of issues for these countries, where China's just trying to get the job done, perhaps through ways that we wouldn't consider to be appropriate in Australia. 
Getting the Chinese view on all of this proved impossible in Vanuatu. Uh, Tom Steinford is my name. I'm from 60 Minutes Australia. I, I wanted to request an interview with the ambassador. Our many interview requests made with the Chinese embassy went unanswered. But Ralph Rengen Vanu was happy to explain the price China charges for its loans and grants. They demand Vanuatu votes with them on critical issues at the United Nations. What, so you think if they can pump money in here, they'll get support at the UN? Yes, because you have to oh, remember... I'm sorry, but that's bribery. Uh, maybe. That's diplomacy. Australia gives a lot of money and expects us to vote for them in certain things, and we do. I mean, this is the give and take of international diplomacy. China's response to the critics of its Pacific policy is to cry foul. It accuses them of racism, pure and simple. But Malcolm Davis says that's not fair. At times, is there an element of racism or, or xenophobia to this discussion? No. Do you think the Chinese try and portray it that way? Yes, but they shouldn't. Uh, you know, we have a legitimate concern about our national security here. And I think to try and suggest that we're being racist is absolutely wrong. Why is that? Because you know, our foreign and defence policy is made here. It's not made in Beijing. Uh, you know, we look at how China is rising in the region, we look at their actions in the South China Sea, we look at the steady growth of their military capabilities and we look at their growth of expanding influence and presence across the Indian Ocean and now in the South Pacific. And you know, these present legitimate concerns to us. So it's not about racism or xenophobia, it's about defence policy. And that's what we're concerned about. Diplomacy is a difficult game in the Pacific right now. Australia used to be the main player here, but we've been scoring own goals of late. For now, the warships welcomed by the island nations of the Pacific continue to be ours. But if we keep on getting it wrong, it may well be China's Navy taking safe harbour in these waters. Since 1942, we have not had to worry about any sort of military threat against our east coast and the potential exists that if we don't get our relationship right with the region and if we don't counterbalance China, then we could be forced into a situation whereby we end up in a more major power conflict. And I think we need to take that prospect seriously. The prospect of major power conflict is once again on the agenda. Hello, I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.